Alrighty then, Burning Tides Part 1, or, well, Act 1, Part 92, but we'll see how we number it. <laughs> Let's go. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to another episode of the Lore of League of Legends. Let's go. People have been asking me to do this for a couple of weeks now, and due to time constraints, I haven't had the chance until now. Mm -hmm. Without further ado, I present to you a narrative of the Burning Tides, The Reckoning. Enjoy. Burning Tides. Oh! Town slaughter docks. They smell as bad as their name suggests. And yet here I am, hidden in the shadows, breathing the blood and bile stink of butchered sea serpents. I melt deeper into the darkness, pulling the brim of my hat down low over my face as heavily armed members of the Jagged Hooks stalk by. They've got a reputation for savagery, these boys. In a fair fight, they might take me down. But I'm not big on playing fair and I'm not here to fight. Not this time. So what brings me here to one of the foulest districts in Bilgewater? Money. What else? It was a That's gamble taking reason, on this job, but the payout is big enough that I couldn't pass it up. And besides, I'd case this place to stack the deck in my favour. I'm assuming he's narrating as Twisted Fate. Because everything so far has been kind of Twisted fate like but, and also it's his picture, so, <laughs> I guess. I don't intend to linger. I want to be in and out as quickly and as quietly as possible. Once the job's done, I aim to collect my payment and be gone before dawn. All goes well. I'll be halfway to Valoran before anyone knows the damn thing's missing. The thugs turn the corner of the massive slaughter shed. It means I've got two minutes until they swing back around. Plenty of time. The silver moon slides behind a bank of clouds, covering the wharf in shadow. Crates from the day's work are scattered across the dock. It makes for easy cover. I see lookouts on top of the main warehouse, silhouettes standing watch, crossbows in hand. They're gossiping loudly like fishwives. I could be wearing bells and these idiots still wouldn't hear me. They think no one would be fool enough to come here. A bloated corpse hangs overhead, a warning for all to see. It spins slowly in the midnight breeze, coming off the harbour. It's an ugly sight. A huge hook, the type used to catch devilfish, holds the body aloft. Stepping over the rusted chains lying limp upon the wet stone, I pass between a pair of towering cranes. They used to haul giant sea serpents into the slaughter sheds for butchering. It's those looming factories are the source of the god's awful stench that permeates everything here. I'm gonna need to buy myself a new set of clothes once this is over. Across the bay, past the chum-churned waters of the slaughter dock, scores of ships lie at anchor, their lanterns swaying gently. One of the vessels draws my eye, a massive black-sailed war galleon. I know whose ship that is. Everyone in Bilgewater knows. I take a moment to gloat. I'm about to steal from the most powerful man in town. There's always a certain thrill that comes from spitting in death's eye. As expected, the main warehouse is locked up tighter than a noblewoman's virtue. Guards posted at every entrance, doors locked and barred. For everyone other than me, it would be impossible to break into. I duck into a blind alley opposite the warehouse. It's a dead end. And it's not as dark as I'd have liked. If I'm still here when the patrol comes back, they will see me. And if they get a hold of me, the best I can hope for is a quick death. More likely, I'll be taken to him. And that would be far more painful, drawn-out way to go. The trick, as always, is not to get caught. Then I hear them, the bruises are returning early. I have seconds, at best. I snap a card from my sleeve and weave it through my fingers. It's as natural as breathing. This is the easy part. The rest can't be rushed. I let my mind drift as the card starts to glow. Pressure builds around me. I'm nearly overcome with the promise of everywhere. Half closing my eyes, I focus and picture where I need to be. Then there's the familiar lurch in the guts as I shift. A displacement of air and I'm outside the warehouse, gone with barely a trace. Damn, I'm good. 
One of the jagged hooks outside might glance up the alley and notice a single playing card falling to the ground, but probably not. It takes a moment for me to get my bearings. Dim light from the lanterns outside creeps in through the cracks in the walls. My eyes adjust. The warehouse is crowded, stacked high with treasures from all over the Twelve Seas. Gleaming suits of armor, exotic works of art, shining silks, all things of considerable value. But not what I'm here for. My attention is drawn to the loading doors at the front of the warehouse where I... I don't know, I really don't like that he's reading it out from like Twisted Fate's perspective. There's too much like I and all that stuff. There's too much like him talking about himself. Like it's kind of annoying. I'm not gonna lie, I just want to know the story. Like not so much about Twisted Fate's perspective. I don't know if the story was told this way, but goddamn, it's kind of annoying. I know I'll find the most recent arrivals. I run my fingertips across the various cartons and crates until I come to a small wooden box. I can feel the power emanating from within. This is what I'm here for. I unlatch the lid. My prize is revealed, a knife of exquisite design lying upon a bed of black velvet. I reach for it. I freeze. Oh my god, I mean, I get it, but, oh man, I just wish you would tell the story, man, like, this whole, like, building of the, of the scene is so, like, kudos to him for, like, the effort, I'm not saying, like, it shouldn't make an effort, but, like, god damn, man, I just can't be bothered, kind of thing, it's like, bro, just tell me what's, what happened. Like, Twisted Fate tried to steal this thing, you know? It's like, okay, we know what Twisted Fate does. He's a magician, whatever, and he can disappear. You know? <laughs> like, that's about it. Like, I need five minutes of, like, scene um, adjustment. Uh, like, understanding the scenes. Like, it's in Bilgewater. Okay, thanks. There's no mistaking that sound. Before he even speaks, I know who's standing behind me in the darkness. TF, says Graves. It's been a long time. I've been here for hours. Some folks might get bored standing still this long, but I've got my anger to keep me company. I ain't leaving this spot until I settle the score. Long after midnight, the snake finally shows. He suddenly appears in the warehouse using that... I won't leave until I settle the score, bro. Just shoot him then. You don't need to explain. Just fucking shoot him. <laughs> the fuck? Same old magic trick. I prime my shotgun, ready to turn him inside out. After years spent looking for that treacherous son of a bitch, here he is. Dead to rights at the end of Destiny's Barrels. TF, I say, it's been a long time. I had better words ready for this moment. Funny how they all went out the window as soon as I saw him. But TF, his face shows nothing. No fear, no regret, no hint of surprise. Not even while facing down a loaded gun. Guts, damn him. Malcolm, how long have you been standing there? He asks. The smile in his voice enrages me. I take aim. I can pull the trigger and leave him deader than sea scum. That's what you should do? I should. Not yet, though. I need to hear him say it. Well, Why'd you do it? I ask, knowing full well he'll just come back with something clever. Is the gun really necessary? I thought we were friends. Friends. The bastards mocking me. Now I want to tear his smug head off, but I've got to keep my cool. You're looking as dapper as ever, he says. I look down at the devilish bites on my clothes. I had to swim to get past the guards. Ever since he got a little money, TF's been stickier for appearance. I can't wait to mess him up. But first I want answers. Tell me why you left me to take the fall, or they'll be picking bits of your pretty face out of the rafters. This is how you've got to deal with TF. Give him room, and he'll pull your strings till you don't know which ends your ass. His slipperiness came in handy when we were partners. Ten damn years in the locker. Know what that does to a man? He doesn't. For once, he's got nothing cute to say. He knows he did me wrong. They did things for me that would have driven most men mad. 
All that kept me from breaking was my anger and thinking about this moment right here. Then comes the clever reply. Sounds like I kept you alive. Maybe you should thank me. That one gets me. I'm so mad I can barely see. He's trying to goad me. Then when I'm blind with rage, he'll do his little disappearing act. I take a breath and leave the bait alone. He's surprised I ain't biting. This time, I'm getting answers. How much do they pay you to sell me out? I growl. TF stands there, smiling, just trying to buy some time. Malcolm, I'll be happy to have this conversation with you, but this really isn't a good time or place. Almost too late, I notice the card dancing through his fingers. I snap out of it and squeeze the trigger. Blam! His card's gone. Almost took his damn hand off, too. Idiot! He barks. I finally made him lose his cool. You just woke up the whole damn island! You know whose place this is? I don't care. I ready a second shot. I barely see his hands move, then cards explode all around me. I fire back, not sure if I want him dead or just almost dead. Before I can find him again in the smoke, fury and splintering wood, a door gets kicked open. A dozen thugs come roaring in just to add to the damn mess. So, do you really want to do this? TF asks, ready to throw another fistful of cards at me. I nod and hold my gun steady on him. It's time to settle up. Things get ugly, fast. The whole damn warehouse is crawling with jagged hooks, but Malcolm couldn't care less. I'm all he's interested in. I sense Graves' next shot coming and turn away. The boom of his gun is deafening. A box explodes where I'd been a fraction of a second earlier. I do believe my old partner is trying to kill me. Somersaulting over a stack of mammoth ivory, I whip a trio of cards in his direction before they hit home. I'm already ducking into cover, looking for an out. I only need a few seconds. He curses loudly, but the cards won't do any more than slow him down. He's always been a tough bastard. Stubborn too. I hate these scenes where it's like, bro, just shoot him. Like, the thing is, he could have shot him without killing him. He didn't have to, like, you know, sneak up behind him, load the gun, and, like, right behind him so he knows he's there. Just shoot him in the legs, let him cry out in agony, and then ask him your fucking questions. And then he also can't escape. <clears throat> like, this whole, like, if your goal is anyways to kill him, but you want to hear a confession, bro, just make it so he cannot run. Let let him say his confession, then kill him. Like it's like it's so annoying. It's like oh, uh, let's just have a fucking conversation. My gun is on you, and let me give you a chance to fucking fight back. It's so dumb, man. I I hate I hate stories like that. It's like bro, just fucking shoot him. You know, stop talking. Never knows when to let things go. You ain't getting away, TF. He growls. Yeah. Not this time. Mm -hmm. Yep. That trait's still riding him hard. He's wrong though, as usual. I'll be taking my leave as soon as possible. Mm. There's no use talking to him when he's out for blood. Another blast and shrapnel ricochets off a priceless suit of Demarcian armor, embedding into the walls and floor. I dart left and right, weaving and fainting, sprinting from cover to cover. He sticks with me, roaring his threats and accusations, his shotgun barking in his hands. Graves moves fast for a big man. I'd almost forgotten that. He's not my only problem. The damn fool stirred up a hornet's nest with all this shooting and hollering. The jagged hooks are all over us, but they're smart enough to leave some men barring the main doors. I have to get gone, but I'm not leaving without what I came for. I've led Graves on a merry dance around the warehouse, and I arrive back where we started a moment before he does. There are hooks between me and my prize and more coming, but there's no time to wait. The card in my hand glows red and I hurl it dead center of the warehouse doors. The detonation blows them off their hinges and scatters the hooks. I move in. One of them recovers faster than I expected and he swings at me with a hatchet. I sway around the blow and kick out his knee, hurling another spread of cards at his friends to keep them honest. My path clear, I swipe the ornate dagger I've been hired to steal, hooking it into my belt. After all this trouble, I might as well get paid. Gaping loading doors beckon, but there are too many damned hooks piling it. There's no way out there, so I make for the only quiet corner left in this madhouse. A card is dancing in my hand as I prepare to shift, 
See, the thing is, it's like he's trying. Like again, nothing against the narrator. Okay, like nothing is. But it's like he's he's so out of character the way he talks in Tia voice. You know, like the whole like. Uh, well, might as well get paid. It's like it definitely was not supposed to be in that tone. You know, it was supposed to be more of a well, might as well get paid kind of thing. You know, it's like this guy, like TF, should be unhinged about anything. Yeah, he lost his school for a second there, but it's like now that he's a bit safer and like he's running away, he should be like more of that sarcastic, um, not so sarcastic, but it's like. I don't know what you call it. It's not cool. It's more like unhinged, right? You're just like, you're just having a blast right now, you know? It's like, not a blast, but like, you're just having fun right now. It's like, you're undisturbed, you know, all that shit. But it's like, the way he narrates it is like, it's too serious. And like, the app doesn't sound like somebody who talks seriously ever, you know? Just like, yeah. We have a few guys chasing us, but like, it's all good, you know, like type of thing. At least that's how I see TF, you know. Well, it starts like he's the... smarter than everyone else, so there's no reason for him to panic, kind of thing. The way Grave appears, stalking me like a rabid bear. Destiny bucks in his grip, and a jagged hook is shot to tatters. Graves' glare is drawn to the car glowing in my hand. He knows what it means and swings the smoking barrels of his gun at me. I'm forced to move, interrupting my concentration. Can't run forever, he bellows after me. For once, he's not stupid. He's giving me the time I need. He's keeping me off my game, and the thought of being taken down by these hooks is starting to weigh on me. Their boss is not known for his mercy. Among the dozen other thoughts rattling around my head is the nagging feeling I've been set up. I've thrown an easy job out of nowhere, a big score just when I need it most, and surprise, there's my old partner standing there waiting for me. Someone a lot smarter than Graves is playing me for a fool. I'm better than this, I kick myself for being sloppy, but there's a dock full of goons waiting to save me the trouble. Right now all that matters is getting the hell away from here. Two blasts from that damn gun of Malcolm send me scurrying. My back slams against a dusty wooden crate. A crossbow bolt lodges in the rotted wood behind me, just inches from my head. No way out, sunshine, Graves yells. I look around and see fire from the explosion starting to spread to the roof. He may have a point. We've been sold out, Graves, I shout. You'd know all about that, he replies. I try reasoning with him. We work together, we can get out of this. I must be desperate. I'd see us both dead before I trust you again, he snarls. I didn't expect anything else. Talking sense to him just makes him angrier, which is exactly what I need. The distraction buys me just enough time to shift outside the warehouse. I can hear Graves roaring inside. No doubt he just rounded on my spot only to find me gone, a single card on the ground taunting him. I launch a barrel of cards through the loading doors behind me. It's long past time for subtlety. I feel bad for a moment about leaving Graves in a burning building, but I know I won't kill him. He's too stubborn for that. Besides, a fire on the docks is a serious deal in a port town. It might buy me some time. As I search for the quickest way off the slaughtered docks, the sound of an explosion makes me look over my shoulder. Graves appears, stepping through the hole he'd just blown out the side of the warehouse. He's got murder in his eyes. I tip my hat to him and run. He comes after me, shotgun booming. I have to admire the man's determination. Hopefully, it won't kill me tonight. The young urchin's eyes were wide and panicked as he was led towards the captain's quarters. It was the agonized screams emanating from the door at the end of the passageway that gave him second thoughts. The cries echoing through a claustrophobic decks of the enormous black warship were heard by every crewman aboard the Deadpool. Such a random transition, bro. <laughs> it's like scene. Anyways, you know, so da -da -da. <laughs> it's like such a random As intended. Transition. The first mate, his face a web of scars, rested a reassuring hand on the boy's shoulders. They came to a halt before the door. The child winced as another tortured wail issued from within. Steady, said the first mate. The captain will want to hear what you've got to say. 
With that, he rapped sharply on the door. It was opened a moment later by a hulking brute with facial tattoos and a broad, curved blade strapped across his back. The boy didn't hear the words spoken between the two men. His gaze was locked on the heavy-set figure seated with his back to him. He was a big man, the captain, and of middling years. His neck and shoulders were thick and bullish, his sleeves were rolled up and his forearms slick with blood. A red great coat hung from a peg nearby, alongside his black tricorn. Gangplank, breathed the urchin, his voice thick with fear and awe. Captain, I figured you'd want to hear this, said the mate. Gangplank said nothing, nor did he turn, still intent as he was on his work. The scarred sailor nudged the boy forward. He stumbled before he caught his footing and shuffled closer. The child approached the captain of the dead pool as he would a cliff's edge. His breath quickened as he caught full sight of the captain's work. Basins of bloody water sat upon Gangplank's desk, along with an array of knives, hooks and gleaming surgical implements. A man lay upon the captain's workbench, bound tightly with leather straps. Only his head was free. He looked around in wild desperation, neck straining, his face covered with sweat. The boy's gaze was inexorably drawn to the man's flayed left leg. The urchin suddenly realised he couldn't remember what he came here to do. Gangplank turned from his work to stare at the visitor. His eyes were as cold and dead as a shark's. He held a slender blade in one hand, delicately poised between his fingers like a fine paintbrush. It's a dying art, Scrimshaw, said Gangplank, his attention returning to his work. Few have the patience for carving bone these days. It takes time, see. Every cut has a purpose. <clears throat> Somehow the man was still alive, despite the ragged wound in his leg. Skin and flesh peeled back from his thigh bone, transfixed with horror, the lad saw the intricate designs the captain had carved upon that bone, coiling tentacles and waves. It was delicate work, beautiful even. That just made it even more terrible. Gangplank's living canvas sobbed. Please, he moaned. Gangplank ignored the pathetic plea and set down his knife. He splashed a cup of cheap whiskey over his work, clearing it of blood. The man's scream threatened to rip his own throat out until he slumped into merciful unconsciousness, his eyes rolling back in his head. Gangplank grunted in disgust. Remember this boy, Gangplank said. Sometimes even those who are loyal forget their place. Sometimes it's necessary to remind them. Real power is all about how people see you. Look weak, even for a moment, and you're done. The chap... I never took Gangplank to be such a fucking um, torturer kind of thing. It doesn't it doesn't like the part I think. Especially like his uh, even his voice lines in the game. It's like yar ha har, you know. It's not like yar har har, you know. It's like he doesn't sound like that kind of guy. But it's like oh man, what would you do in this situation like this? I'm gonna rip my throat out and then just pass out. I don't know. I wish I would, I don't, I hope I'm never in a situation where it's like, bro, honestly, better dead than captive, you know? Child nodded, his face now drained of color. Wake him, said Gangplank, gesturing towards the unconscious crewman. The whole crew needs to hear his song. As the ship's surgeon stepped forward, Gangplank swung his gaze back to the child. Now, he said, what did you want to tell me? A, a man, said the boy, his words faltering. A man on the Rat Town docks. Go on, Gangplank said. He, he was trying not to be seen by the hooks, but, but I seen him. Mm-hmm, Gangplank muttered as he began to lose interest. He turned back to his work. Keep going, lad, the first mate urged. He was playing around with some fancy deck of cards. They glowed funny. Gangplank stood up from his chair like a colossus rising from the depths. Tell me where, he said. The leather belt of his holster creaked in his tightening grip. By the warehouse, the big one near the sheds. Gangplank's face flushed an angry shade of crimson as he pulled on his greatcoat and claimed his hat from its peg. His eyes glinted red in the lamplight. The child was not alone in taking a wary step back. Give the boy a silver serpent and a hot meal captain ordered to his first mate as he strode purposely toward the cabin door and get everyone to the docks 
We've got work to do. Why does Gangplank want to find uh, TF kind of thing? Interesting. Maybe he's just a, uh, he's just want men everywhere. Maybe that's what it is. I don't know. Okay, well, that was Act 1. And yeah, let's go to Act 2.